This is lecture. Welcome everybody again. So this is lecture 27 in high dimensional probability and data science. And last couple lectures we started to, to go over fundamental uh, fundamental laws of random metrics theory, which is a, an area of modern probability theory, which is very active now, and, uh, and all of this has been still in development. So we we covered two two fantastic theorems. One is the semicircle law, semicircle law, and the other is margin Pasteur. Semicircle law due to Wigner, Eugene Wigner, uh, 59, states that if, if you take a, a symmetric random matrix, uh, IID entries, let's just, let's just you know, take the square matrix and put a Gaussian random variable, a normal independent standard mean zero variance when every very simple random variable as an entry, each entry, this matrix, such matrix is called the Wigner matrix. Then the eigenvalues, the bulk of eigenvalues, in the precise sense of which we defined last time, if I normalize by root n, the bulk of eigenvalues converges, the histogram converges to the semicircle. Um, semicircle density this is a pdf not a semicircle and the precise sense of this is that if you if you want to know how many eigenvalues what's a fraction of the eigenvalues let's say lies in this interval you can approximately compute it by computing the area of the circle the area under under this so this gives you a fraction of the eigenvalues that's Wigner semicircle law. And we covered the Marchenko Pasteur law for the other um, natural model of a random matrix. This time, this random matrix is generated from data. It's a sem sem sample covariance matrix. Sample covariance matrix of a pure noise, a white Gaussian noise. Sigma n is one over n sum, so it's an average over the sample xi, xi transpose, where xi is normal. So this is a data, very just some random data like this, pure noise. And the similar result of the bulk of eigenvalues of this matrix of sigma n, which is a random matrix, converge this time not to the semicircular law, but to something else. And it's obvious that it should be something else because now there are two parameters. There is parameter n, the sample size, and there is d, the dimension in which the data lives. So the law will be different depending on n and d, and the density. The limit in density is something like this. Okay. Something like this. The endpoints of this density are one minus root r squared and one plus root r squared, where r is the ratio dimension divided by the sample over sampling ratio. Such metrics is usually, this random metric is usually called Wishart matrix. It was introduced by Wisher well before Marchenko was to prove that. In the same sense, the convergence holds in the same sense that if you're interested in how many eigenvalues, let's say, fall in any interval, let's say this interval, we can compute it. We can compute the fraction of the eigenvalues that lie in this interval 
by computing this integral. So just a fraction of the area in this curve approximates a fraction of the eigenvalues in the integral. Okay. Good. Any questions? That's what we did last time. Good. So today, I thought it's a good day since we're finishing this, this block uh, about random matrices to give a general overview uh, of, kind of a wider perspective in random matrices, other fundamental laws. What, what else do we know in random matrices and what people are interested in now without proofs? So let's go. So what is even a simpler model of a random matrix? The, the, the most simple, like you, you say, so, random matrix, and what would be the simplest model? It's a non-symmetric matrix. So just take a random ma matrix, square, let's say square, put independent entry, all of them independent entries, no symmetry, don't impose any symmetry. So that's called a Ginebra random matrix. And the corresponding law is, let me show you three. The corresponding law is called circular law. I'll explain why. Circular law due to Ginebra in 1965. So here we have n by n, iid, independent and identically distributed entries. No symmetry. So we do not one symmetric matrix anymore. Why did we even want that symmetry in the first place? <laughs> what, what, what was the purpose of symmetry? To make sure that there are real and real uh, eigenvalues? Exactly, exactly. To make sure the eigenvalues are real. And so we can talk about the histogram, the distribution on the line. Exactly. So now we, if we drop symmetry assumption, the eigenvalues are no longer real. They can be complex now. Okay. And they will be complex. And if you look at where the eigenvalues will be, I made an, so someone made this experiment. Let me show you. This is the result. Two by two matrices and their eigenvalues. Three by three matrices, four by four, five by five. At 50 by 50, it becomes convincingly, very, very con convincing that this eigenvalues follow some law and this, they, they converge, the bulk of them converges to this circle, to the disk actually inside the circle. Yeah. And that is, that is true. So the circular law states that the bulk of eigenvalues converge of, of um, again, same normalization, m divided by root n, the same way as we did in the symmetric case. It converges to the uniform distribution, uniform distribution on the, on the unit disk. Which is this. In the same rigorous sense, you, I'll not write this down exactly, but I guess you now understand what the rigorous sense of this would be for any, no, not the interval, but for any, let's say for any set like this. <laughs> if I want to know how many eigenvalues fall there, what's a fraction of eigenvalues that falls there, we can compute it approximately as a fraction of the area of that circle, of the square in the circle. So that's that's a precise meaning of this, okay? Done, circular law, any questions? Good, okay. What these laws, although these laws are very beautiful, they don't answer one important question. They are not, they don't care about outliers. It is totally possible that, at least from this laws, it's not. It's it's totally possible that 
so there are maybe one eigenvalue or maybe a couple eigenvalues outside the circle or outside the um, marchenko pastor law outside the circular law this the semicircle law right because they care about the fraction they answer the question how do you compute the number of the fraction of the eigenvalues here well the fraction it's not affected by one or, or eigenvalue and that is important it's it's why do we care about outliers why do we care about this eigenvalue well because pca depends on them right the whole idea of pca is to catch this outliers is to catch this, this the eigenvalues that stick out because they correspond to the information they correspond to the communities to the to the clusters in the data as we saw so we want to make sure that these the 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 outliers are from the true data are due to the to the real information in the data and not because of the noise so the question is is it true that in the circular that in these laws there are no outliers in other words what are the extremal values here is it really two is it really one plus root r and so on and so forth and the answer is yes there are no outliers a very surprising statement in, in the statistics that rigorously shows that although the entries are very random the entries could could have out the entries could be very large or small the eigenvalues work collectively to make sure nobody like all of these sheep are located in in here and they don't go astray there are no outliers so this is extreme eigenvalues the laws for extreme eigenvalues first for the Wigner metrics it's called by and yin law from 1980 1998 1988 sorry for Wigner metrics uh, W remember when I say Wigner I mean this and by n actually yeah and by n symmetric IAD entries okay and by n symmetric IAD normal entries that's Wigner so for Wigner metrics w divided by root n we know it con should converge to the semicircle and this it is true that it does converge to the edge of the semicircle which is two so it converges to two almost surely almost surely means with probability one with probability one the largest eigenvalue actually converges to two and there is no other eigenvalues it means that there is nothing else here and the smallest eigenvalue by symmetry if you just flip the matrix the smallest eigenvalue converges to minus two almost surely so no surprise there the corresponding law for the sample covariance matrix is called is also due to Bayin and also Krishnaya Krishnaya 1988 for sample covariance matrix Sigma n and when we in this class when we say sample covariance matrix again let's go back check sample covariance matrix is this obtained from the norm from just pure noise so that sample variance matrix number of samples n dimension d oversampling or undersampling factor r so d over n is r and here is <clears throat> here are the endpoints and this law says that yes the extreme eigenvalues actually converge to these endpoints the largest one converges to one plus root r squared almost surely and the smallest one converges to one minus root r squared almost surely good that's by yin law by yin krishnaya it's considerably harder to prove but it's not and we could have proved that maybe three lectures or so Any questions about the extreme eigenvalues? 
Okay. Now, as we know that extreme eigenvalues do converge, for example, here to two and to minus two. So there is, let me show you this again. This is a semicircle, minus two, two in the extreme eigenvalue here, but it is still random. It still has some fluctuation, right? There is some, still a little bit of a wiggling room. The question is, what is this fluctuation? How stable is this law? So the, the, the largest eigenvalue, how, how much does it fluctuate around this value too? Um, actually, let's do not normal. Let's not normalize. Let's just take W. It's a just the original matrix. Original matrix n by n symmetric. Wigner matrix uh, entries are normal zero one. Then the largest eigenvalue is around two root n. And the question is how how much does it fluctuate? What's the standard deviation? Is it root n? It would be kind of too bad. Is it smaller and to the one fourth maybe? <laughs> is it a constant <laughs> fluctuation? And, and the reality beats all expectations. It's actually less than a constant. It's, it's smaller than, than a constant. It's n to the minus one over six. <laughs> Who can think of something like this? So the fluctuation, the window of, of fluctuation of the uh, of the edge of the spectrum is n to the minus one over six. This is unimaginable. This is called Tracy Widom law. Where this is from 1994, and we're slowly moving toward present time uh, for Wigner matrices. For Wigner matrices, so n by n, independent, symmetric, normal, lambda one, it says, well, informally, let me do first informally, lambda one of w, so the largest eigenvalue should be right here, is approximately two root n plus or minus this fluctuation, n to the minus one sixth. And more precisely, lambda one, Let's subtract its kind of mean to root n. Let's divide by the standard deviation, which is I multiply into the n one sixth. So I subtracted the mean, divide by standard deviation, I standardized it, right? Now we should expect in statistics, we, in probability, we should expect that this, this converges to the normal distribution, right? something like that. But it doesn't converge to the normal distribution, in fact. It converts to something else, and that something else is called the Tracy Widom distribution. There are a couple of versions of it, TW1. So Tracy Widom distribution. And if you look weak, I'll not exactly define it. It's it's some function. It's it's a it's a very nice, very interesting function like this. Non-symmetric distribution. So one tail is lighter than the other, and the mean. The mean is about minus 1.21, something like that. So this is the, the density of it. But you look at Wikipedia, I'll not define it precisely. The point is that there is a limiting law. The largest eigenvalue has mean about two root n, has a has variance or oh, standard deviation about n to the minus one over six, which is very surprising. You should expect something larger. And when standardized, it converges to some to some distribution. And similarly, for sample covariance matrices, the same similar law holds. This is due to Johnstone, and in the in the general form, to Feldheim and Sodin, two thousand nine. We're still. Converging to the present time, oh, 2009. So this is, uh, it says that the, the largest eigenvalue here minus, converges to one plus root R, the smallest converges to the one minus root R, which are the endpoints. Let me show you very quickly again, the reminder, these are the endpoints of marchenko pastur law. So they do converge to the endpoints, very good. And the standard deviation is a little 
funny here, so I'll just write it this way. D to the one six, one minus root R two third D to the one six. Standard deviation is very, it's a little strange, but it, they do converge to Tracy Widom law. If you need that. Good, any questions? Okay, so but, uh, yeah, go ahead, Paolo. Um, um, but uh, even with probability one, it means that it's possible to have uh, an outlier. Uh, like uh, you said, the result is almost surely, but it, it still means that we can have an outlier from time to time. Does it? Does it? Uh, no, no, it means, okay, let me, let me, <laughs> almost surely, what does that mean? It means yeah. that the limit of this is n goes to infinity equals this with probability one like that yeah yeah okay so, we, so what we uh, no it, it doesn't it, it excludes everything from time to time right this was probably this is a sequence that whisper yeah with probability zero everything can happen right but exactly there might be a set with probability zero that ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 with, with probability zero everything in the world can happen yeah there is we, we don't have any control on, of that yes but uh <laughs> but with probability one the sequence actually converges to to the truth so there is no no outliers yeah but in, we never we can never control anything with probability zero i think so and no but that just mean does it mean that sometimes we, we can see on, on this graph so this graph we never see anything outside of these intervals right mm, yes uh, never. Uh, for example outside of my, uh, minus two to two uh, but does it mean that it is still possible that we will see it with probability zero uh yeah with probability, yeah um i guess so let's Okay, let's let's make it a more let's make it a a more kind of quantitative statement, which is. Oh, am I misunderstanding? <laughs> okay, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, so the, the answer is no. With probability zero, you will not see events, right? They happen. Anything that happens with probability zero, you won't see. But you can say, well, but I I never observe infinite. This this is for the infinite sequence. I have to generate matrices that are larger, 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 larger. And the sequence will convert the, the largest eigenvalues will converge to, to this, but um, but you don't in practice you don't see infinite sequences right you only generate finite, and this is why we have this result. So, if you look at this distribution, you'll you'll have you will be able to quantify exactly the probability of the events of anything. So, let's say what is the probability that I will find an I outlier larger than. 2.5, for example, or 2.1. And that distribution, if you look up with the Wikipedia, you just compute the, the tail, the, the integral, and you'll get exact answer for that. That is a probability. And the probability decays exponentially fast to zero. So that that's that is a very quantitative, could be made a quantitative statement. Okay. Good. In fact, if you look at Feldheim sodium. It's a non-asymptotic result. I put it as an asymptotic result, but it is a non-asymptotic result. It says that for any little, for any dimension, here is a probability that you will find. So it's, it gives confidence intervals in very good shape. Any other questions? That was a good one. Okay, good. All right. Well, this is all baby models. This is all models for data without any structure. We just take a pure noise and we, we have fun with it. We, comp we compute the, the limiting distribution of the spectra of pure noise. Now, what is, let's, let's go more realistic now. So structure to data, structured data. Let's take one more step toward being more realistic. And this, one the simplest model of structured data is a spike model you'll see it in the homework in the next homework this is due to bike the results are due to bike benaru 
and Bichet, 2005. First for Wigner matrices. Here, the idea is this. Instead of taking the Wigner matrix per se, just the noise, W, we add some signal to it, which kind of it should mean this the real structure in the data. Well, maybe the communities that are a little bit separated that way. So you add something like this, maybe a rank one signal. So this is kind of think of this as noise and of this as a signal. And let's call this matrix M, where U is unit vector. And B, beta is the strength of the signal or signal to noise ratio. And, uh, and this matrix is rank one. Yeah. So think of this as we have a noise, isotropic noise, just random Gaussian, and that's our W. On top of that, we add a little bit of a signal, which is rank one matrix in one direction u the signal is kind of it may be buried in the noise or it may stick out of the noise and the question is now you observe the data from this model you observe m can you tell that there is signal there can you detect the signal can you can we compute u for example and the results are very interesting so the results are sometimes you can and sometimes you can't so the largest eigenvalue First of all, the bulk of the eigenvalues will converge to the, to, the, to the semicircle law, but the largest eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue, sometimes it could be buried in the noise if the strengths of the signal, as measured by this parameter beta, the strengths of the signal, if beta is less than one. So here, this is this is bad. The signal. The signal drowns in the noise. So you, it's the same semicircle law. You don't get to see the signal if beta is less than one. But if beta is greater than one, then you can detect it. It converts to beta plus one over beta. So this eigenvalue, a single out eigenvalue will pop out of the spectrum. And we're happy here. So the signal is detectable. And here we have what physicists would call a phase transition between the regime where the signal is so weak that nothing can detect it there's the, the spectrum is absolutely the same you look at the spectrum you don't see anything same spectrum and then as soon as the signal's strength passes above one then it suddenly becomes detected it pops out of the spectrum and we can see the phase transition the eigenvector corresponding eigenvector v1 of m u Sorry, V1 of M. What is our ID, I, no, I, in the ideal life? The, the, the largest eigenvector will correspond to the largest eigenvalue. And it should be, if beta is very large, it should be U. We want it to be U. The PCA, the PCA what, all of the idea of the PCA, if we, if we work on this, is, is that it will detect this U as the largest eigenvector, right? So we hope that it is, correlated with u. We hope that the largest eigenvector of m is correlated with the signal. And let's measure the correlation using the inner product. Okay, so unsurprisingly, in the regime, in this drowning regime, where the signal is too weak, there is no correlation. Okay, you don't get to see anything, just Look at this, and, and this is impossible to detect this way. In the, but if the signal becomes stronger, there is correlation, non-trivial correlation. And the stronger the signal becomes, the more correlation. And as you can see from here, 
if beta goes to infinity, if the strength of the signal goes to infinity, the correlation goes to one. So this eigenvector actually detects it perfectly. So this is what's happening here. This is u and this is v1 of m and the, this angle goes to zero here. So what's the message? It means that the PCA works in this second regime. Works if and only if beta, uh, ah, no, 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 PCA. This is, this is for, sorry, this is for Wigner matrices, for Wishart magic, for sample covariance matrices, similar results. Sample covariance matrices. Similar model. So we have, uh, let's say, our sigma, the sample covariance matrix of the population. It was identity before, right? We just, before, before let me show you the previous slide here. Before, here, the sample covariance matrix is this. The true covariance matrix is identity, which means it's a noisy isotropic, doesn't have any structure. That was a baby model. Let's now move to something more realistic. So instead of the baby model, I add the signal here. So the sigma, the true, the true covariance matrix would be identity in dimension D plus again, beta U, U transpose. In the baby model, this was one minus root R squared, one plus root R squared, Marchenko Pasteur law. Now what happens? Same thing, only a different phase transition levels. So almost surely, as before, almost surely, the largest eigenvalue converges to the end point of the spectrum. If beta is small, so if the signal is less than root r, and r is r is d over n. So if the signal is too weak, the largest eigenvalue will actually be here. It will not pop out from the spectrum. It will drown in the noise. So the signal drowns. Too weak. But if it is a little bit larger, then it starts to pop out. Don't pay special attention to this form of the expression, but it, it means that it, it will pop out if beta is greater than root r. And here we're happy, happy face. Uh, signal is detectable. Detectable. which means that the, 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 the largest eigenvalue would be here, will pop out of the spectrum and you will see it when you plot the, the eigenvectors. And very similarly, we can, should be, this should be sigma, of course, sigma n, sigma n here. And this, the largest, the, the top eigenvector will be correlated with u, well, sometimes uncorrelated, if beta is less than root r, same thing, and sometimes correlated. So if the signal is larger, then again, don't pay special attention to this. The point is, the point is if the signal becomes stronger and stronger, the correlation will go to one. So the signal will become more and more perfectly detectable. So here we are happy because the u and v1 of sigma n, the angle becomes smaller and smaller. So this is a result from 2005, I believe. Bake and Aru and Pichy. So what's, what's, the, what's the takeout message from this? That PCA sometimes does not work if the signal is, uh, if, if signal is weak and and sometimes it does work. And so PCA works if and only if the strength of the signal beta is greater than root R. And remember, 
r is d over n so this means that the sample size is greater than d over beta squared so this is the phase transition it's a great result it says that the sample size needs to be just linear in d a little bit over linear in d and it it would depend on the strength of the signal of course but that's great it, it says that there is no curse of high dimensionality here linear sample in the dimension is fine any questions so this was a story about the extreme eigenvalues how they converge to the endpoints so no no outliers and the story about structured data that if we have the signal then sometimes we can catch the signal it will pop out and sometimes it will drown depending on the strength of the signal and here is precise information if you look at this paper it's, it's there's much more in there uh for example you may ask well there is only rank one signal so it means that we have maybe two communities two two, two clusters and they give us some some signal what if there is like 10 communities what if the signal is actually rank 10 well in this paper there is there are answers for that too okay so there's maybe rank two rank three rank four and so on good any questions on that good hey and our next thing almost the last one is an, an interesting story story about the joint eigenvalue distribution of random matrices all of what we did before was either about the bulk of the eigenvalues like i want to know what is the fraction of the eigenvalues lying here or about a single outlier a single eigenvalue which is the largest one but we can ask what is the joint distribution for example do, are they independent kind of independent eigenvalues do they look like independent random variables or they cooperate with each other they can maybe repel they maybe they maybe maybe they attract each other something like this what do these points do as eigenvalues so let's 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 see the story so let's say we take the Wigner matrix in this there is a very fine print here that the the Wigner matrix here I'm considering is this I'm looking first at the d by d matrix with uh, n by n sorry n by n matrix run the matrix with iid independent and identically distributed normal entries and then I symmetrize it so I take a plus a transpose over two so that's that's my way of symmetrization if you think a little bit it means that it means that the the uh, off the uh, the on the diagonal you will have normal random variables with variance one but off the diagonal the variance will be one over root two I think if I divide it by root two the variance will be one but I divide by two so the variance is that's a fine little thing there anyhow the joint distribution the joint density of eigenvalues lambda one we arrange them in the non-increasing order lambda one lambda two lambda n and very surprisingly the joint the joint density can be computed directly so here is the joint density x1 through xn it is uh, it is proportional to the following e to the minus one half times the sum of the squares times something else but before I write something else let me ask you guys if I stopped here what what would that be what is the message of this uh, of this density if this was the truth normal normal more yeah. than that normal metric normal uh standard normal standard normal but, 
what do we know about what dependent independent Different independent things. i would Indep say exactly okay independent and that's because it's just it would be just a product right we can write it as a product of e to the i square over two i from one to n so the the density factors and that that is our telltale that the random variables are independent so if i just stopped here that would mean that the random the, the, the eigenvalues of this random matrix are independent random variables independent standard normal random variables and that would be false right because then with the, the the how can we do how can we say the semicircle law well it is not semicircle law it would be just a normal law that's false so there is there is something else and something else is the factor that makes cooperation between the eigenvalues and here is a very similar very interesting factor it's just a Vandermont determinant xi minus xj just the Vandermont determinant and that is now the truth this is the joint distribution of the eigenvalues of a, of a symmetric random matrix Hey, now let me ask you guys. Now this is it's a more delicate question. What does this do? What does this term do in terms of cooperation between the eigenvalues? Let's say adjacent eigenvalues. Let me help you out a little bit. It, it repels them. It's right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Someone wanted to say something too? I want to hold the answer to that. I, I, I think uh, it might introduce some covariance metrics here. Yes, yes. So the covariance actually would be in a non trivial. Yes, yes. But it, it, this is a repulsion factor. Yes, Pablo. So it, the 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 eigenvalues repel. Why so? What, why why do you say so? Pablo, can you explain? Uh, well, because uh, the larger the distance, the more it the, the probability the, the density will be larger if if the distance is larger. So that's the into why, why I said that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So imagine that we have x i and x j very close to each other. Then this term will be small. Right? So this term is smaller when the where the eigenvalues are closer to each other. And that means the density is smaller. So this means that, and the density is smaller means that this is less likely. So the, 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 this density is trying to make this events less likely that the eigenvalues are close to each other and more likely when the eigenvalues are far from each other, xi minus g. Okay? So it's a repulsion factor. So this is small when xi is very similar to xj and, and and small means unlikely the smaller the density the more the less likely it is so this means that this factor acts as a repulsion factor the re eigenvalues adjacent eigenvalues repel from each other that's what they that's what it is so, so imagine this this process point process of normal random variables in which there is actually repulsion force between them. So that's that's it. This is eigenvalues. The first factor is as if the first factor is as if the eigenvalues are standard normal i i d. But the second factor introduces this repulsion factor, repulsion force between them. Good. Any questions about this? All of these results, except maybe the very last one, the closed form expression, hold not only for normal distributions, but other distributions. And this is called universality. Universality phenomenon says that all the results above, maybe except the last one, because the last one is so precise formula that it doesn't have to hold. Um, hold not only for normal distributions, but for general 
or more general distributions. without change, without any change. For many of them, just variance zero and, sorry, mean zero variance once suffices. For some of them, you need some moment assumptions, but, and you can check these results, but, uh, but the main point is that the normal distribution doesn't play any special role there. Okay. Any questions on universality? Okay, and now the last part is to connect this to the outside world, outside mathematics, maybe, or outside the probability theory connections. In fact, the story starts with physics, with nuclear physics. Eugene Wigner uh, was a physicist who tried to understand the spectrum of atoms. For some simple atoms, the spectrum is very simple, and that's how you, did, how you do this in spectroscopy. But the first for heavy, um, for heavy elements such as uranium two hundred thirty-eight, this uh, the nucleus is so large and the forces are they're so complicated that it is not clear what happens. What are the what are the energy levels, the quantum energy levels of the heavy nuclei? So he he made he did this experiment. Maybe many people did it before him and after him. Experiments with when you bombard the 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 uh, the nucleus and it splits and it emits some energy and from that you detect the the possible energy levels of the spectrum of this the spectrum so energy or resonance levels there is lots of them there is a lot a lot a lot of them a lot of the levels they look like this um and nobody understands them. You, you look at this, so many of them, some, some parts of this is almost full with levels, continuous, and some of them stick out and, and you don't, don't understand this. So he had a very interesting idea, Wigner. It's called Wigner's surmise. And the idea is this, all right. We don't understand the levels. We don't, there is no way to compute them using physics uh, analytically. There is no way to simulate them on the computer. You pretty much pretty quick, quickly get the the, um, uh, the curse of high dimensionality, and there is no way you can do this. Okay, well, so what did physicists did in the nineteenth century when they can't when they can't figure out how you know even four molecules interact with each other, like body, four body problem, and less so how millions of molecules interact with each other. They what they they pass to the statistical model. They say, okay, we don't care what individual molecules like. We we we're interested in the global situation. So we model this statistically. And why don't we do this here? We don't understand the laws that govern this this interactions here. And so why don't we make this laws random? <laughs> it's a crazy idea, but as we don't understand them, so maybe they just they're just random things happening in the nucleus. And so instead of writing this laws in form of the Hamiltonian matrix with a self self adjoint infinite dimensional uh, operator, which we don't know, which we don't understand, why don't we just model this as a random matrix? <laughs> totally crazy idea. You don't understand the Hamiltonian, you don't know how to write it down. Let's write it down as a, as a random matrix. So approximate the Hamiltonian as a, as a random matrix. Now the energy levels are the eigenfunctions of uh, sorry the uh, yeah the energy levels are the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian in physics. So the energy levels, they are eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, which we do not understand. But when we do this transfer, they will become the eigenvalues of random matrix. Taken values of a random matrix. Okay, so the, now comes the next idea. So he says, is there anything that we know about this Hamiltonian at all? Well, we know Hamiltonian has to be self-adjoint operator in the Hilbert space. So we make this random matrix symmetric. But other than that, 
we don't know pretty much anything. And so let's let's just make it a symmetric random matrix. <laughs> The, the whole philosophy behind this is grounded in the maximization of entropy principle, maximal entropy principle, that um, if we have a, a, a system that's complex enough, then in the long run, the system will behave totally chaotically with maximum entropy, given the constraints. Right? So if you have those constraints, let's say I constrain the air to be in this room, then pretty much the air will be everywhere in this room, given the constraints. And this, the Wigner surmise takes us to a new level. It, it says, what as long as we don't understand the, level, the laws of nature, the physical laws, let's make them completely random, given the constraints. And the only constraint is self adjointedness, which is a symmetry of the metric. So that's, that's his idea. That's called Wigner surmise. And then he, we, he modeled the, uh, the energy levels and, and found that pretty much they, are, they, they, they do uh, correspond to random matrices. They, they're very similar to the eigenvalues of the random matrix. And moreover, this way he demonstrated that the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues repel from each other. And therefore the energy levels in the uranium repel from each other. That was only conjectured to be true and only proved by experimental physicists later. Uh, but for lo very long, for, for a long time in nuclear physics, the, uh, the standing conjecture was that the energy level, if they were statistically, if we model them statistically, they, they were looked like Poisson process, basically. So they, they looked like completely independent from each other. They could collide, they could... This. And, um, and that demonstrated the energy levels, actually, they cooperate with each other, they repel. And the repulsion force is this, so you can just predict how they, how exactly they repel, and so on and so forth. This was a very interesting and very successful story of um, of abstract mathematics applied, sorry, applied to to nuclear physics in the first time. And for that and other work, he, Eugene Wigner got the Nobel Prize in 1959, I think. So that was that was that. Any questions? Good. Next and last story is the connections to number theory. Number theory. This is called Montgomery's Montgomery pair correlate. No, sorry, pair correlation conjecture. Still unsolved. Okay, so here we come to the present time where we where we do not have the results. <laughs> now finally, we, we come to the point where we don't have the result, but we have a beautiful, beautiful uh, conjecture. So this is about Riemann zeta function. Riemann zeta function, which is defined as the simple series n to the minus s, like this for any s. Um, it's defined for, I think, when the real, when the real part of S is greater than one, then it converges and then analytically continue to the entire complex plane. Um, have you seen this before, Riemann? Yeah, zeta function. Okay. You can rewrite this and Euler did it first as an Euler product over primes. So you take the product over all primes and you put this one minus p to the minus s, which shows a, a, an intimate connection between Riemann function and the primes and the number theory, which is called analytic number theory. Now the Riemann hypothesis hypothesis states that the zeros uh, of of Riemann zeta function are either trivial. There are minus two, minus four, minus six, and so on and so forth, or they lie on the critical line, vertical line at one half. 
So this is this is where all zeros are supposed to be located. The, the, the trivial zeros are easy, but but the, the, the difficult part is to prove that all of the remaining zeros, non-trivial zeros, are the, on the critical line. This is considered to be the the uh, the, the most famous unsolved problem in mathematics to prove Riemann hypothesis. Have you heard of it? Yeah, Riemann hypothesis. Perfect. Okay, good. All right. So here, here comes probability. We don't understand the the zeros, and and you can plot them. It's it's easy to plot. It's, they become uh, yeah. Of course, you know. Yeah, the zeros. I think they become denser, right? I'm not a number theory. I, I forgot. I think they become denser as you go up, right? Anybody remembers? Denser or sparser? I think denser as you go up, and then uh, maybe you rescale them so that the density becomes uniform. And then, and then the question, okay, we don't understand the zeros of the Riemann function, fine. We don't understand the density of primes, fine. Let's, so what, what do we do when we don't understand things? <laughs> Let's model them as random numbers. <laughs> Let's think of them as random numbers. And the conjecture, Montgomery's pair correlation conjecture, is that the zeros of the Riemann functions repel in exactly the same way as the eigenvalues of the symmetric random matrix. And in the same way as the, as the energy levels of the uranium 238, which is just crazy. But this is this is a MPCC Montgomery pair correlation conjecture. It's a distribution, a little more technically, just the distribution, probability distribution of spacings. Between the zeros of Riemann function is about the same as the distribution of spacings between the eigenvalues of Wigner random matrices, which is whose exact density is given above. So this is this this introduces this repulsion. So there, in particular, the adjacent the adjacent um, adjacent zeros of Riemann function repel from each other in this form, which is funny because they're deterministic numbers, but but they they tend to repel in statistics in statistical sense, and that is one of the uh, well. The most unsolved, the, the most famous unsolved problem in math is Riemann hypothesis, and and this one is an amazing problem that connects together many many areas: number theory, uh, analytic number theory, Riemann hypothesis, and the, the and random magic theory, which is still unsolved. And that's the end of the story for today. Mm -hmm. So we gave a a good overview of this we could have proved all this except of course the, the conjecture in um, in about a I think half a semester maybe a semester which means that it's it all of them are non-trivial results but it also means that that you might be ready to do that it's just a matter of time that you and and, and we'll, we'll do something else i'll i'll uh, i'll post the i already posted the uh, lecture notes it's uh, in some sense, they are unique for this lecture because I haven't seen this material collected in one place before. Uh, so you'll have access to the lecture notes and also to the bibliography references should you need any any of this. Good. Any questions? Good. I will. We'll wait to see if any of us proves remain hypothesis or maybe Montgomery pair correlation conjecture will be fun. Thanks. Okay, people. As promised. So two things. One, um, meeting on Tuesday with Thomas Strummer. I'll send a reminder. Tuesday. Six o'clock, six p.m. Uh, Kiev time. He's a very, very broad researcher. Thomas Strummer connect. He lives. Okay, let me actually stop recording. <laughs>
stop recording here.